So our next um, panel is Macro Trends in Education, and I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then I'll have a seat with them, and we'll we'll talk about a few things. So when we put together this panel, we were thinking about how to represent education. The education cluster, we realize already that education is such a broad term, and you can break it down and dissect it in so many different ways, and it has subsets within. So we thought to... Uh, invite a diverse representation of our education community. And so we have representation from the education technology lens, the education higher education uh, registrant lens, and also the semantic layer lens of what credentials actually mean. And so to start off, I'd like to introduce Manoj Cuddy. He's the founder and CEO of Greenlight Credentials, a leading verified credentials platform that enables users to access and share their verified education, health and fitness records, and get matched to college and career opportunities. Previously, he founded LoudCloud Systems, where he was chairman and CEO. LoudCloud was successfully sold and is currently a part of Barnes & Noble's education, where he served as managing director. Manoj serves as Board of Trustees of Dallas Education Foundation, the Peru Museum of Nature and Science. He also sits on the board of the Center for Brain Health at UT Dallas. Manoj has a bachelor's degree in computer engineering and MBA. He lives in Dallas with his wife and daughter. So thank you so much, Manoj, for joining us today. And then next, I'd like to introduce Scott. Scott Cheney is Credential Engine's first chief executive officer, where he leads the organization's efforts to bring transparency to credentials and reveal the marketplace of credentials. He opened Credential Engine's doors in 2017, the month of April. He has over 30 years experience in developing skills of the workforce to meet the needs of the economy. Prior to Credential Engine, he served as policy director for the Workforce Economic Development and Pensions for Senator Patty Murray and the Senate Health, Education, Labor, Pensions Help Committee. He led the reauthorization of this country's central workforce development legislation, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and his first paycheck in his career path came from Dr. Seuss. A little fun fact there. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy from Carleton College and a Master's of Public Policy from Georgetown. Welcome, Scott. And last but not least, Mike Simmons. Um, Dr. Mike Simmons represents ACRO, where he serves, uh, he leads strategic initiatives and business development. He manages a portfolio of external grants and projects with a particular focus on comprehensive learner records. He is recently retired from University of North Texas, where he served as Assistant Vice President of Academic Affairs in the Provost Office of Curricular Innovation and Academic Partnerships. He led a number of academic uh, innovation projects, including the development of career-connected comprehensive learner records, CLR-LER. For our education group, we know that term well. Before joining the UNT team, Dr. Simmons was Assistant Vice President for Lifelong Learning at Texas Women's University. He also previously served as a founding director of the Marshall Technology Institute. He holds a PhD in Public Administration and Urban Affairs from the University of Texas Arlington and a Master's of Public Administration from UNC Chapel Hill. His Bachelor's of Arts degree is in History from King College in Bristol, Tennessee. So a lot of great education talent at the table, and um, we're going to look forward to answering some questions. All right. So if you don't mind, my first question is, can each of you point out one or two macro issues in education, and what was it that drew you to Velocity based on that perspective? So we're going to open up with that question, and I'll start us off in the, the order that I introduced you all. So Manoj, take that question first. Well, our, our genesis about five years ago was inspired by three uh, different uh, perspectives. One was, uh, I, some of you may recall, that ITT Technical Institutes went out of business about six years ago, and uh, the community college president... Uh, in Dallas where I live, came to me and said, it's just a beast trying to uh, get the transcripts of all of these students who 
are midway through their program and we have been asked to enroll some of these students. And the registrar's office had, of course, shut down. And it was very interesting as I went back and looked. Every year, about five to ten colleges shut down. And we were wondering what would those students or the alumni of those colleges do if they wanted their records verified? And how soon would they be able to get those records verified? So it seemed like a crazy problem. Around the same time, uh, and the, I'm echoing what the HCA folks just said, the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Association president manages about 70 hospitals in that area, and we were t uh, talking to him, and he said that not a day goes by when uh, there's someone that we interview, we like that person, we tell that person that you get to uh, produce your credentials, and uh, they can't do it. Um, and if they can't do it, then we get, go to the next person, and the person who couldn't do it loses out on that opportunity. So it's it was another uh, aha moment. And the third aha moment for us was, uh, I serve on the Dallas ISD Education Foundation Board, and the, the time that it takes for especially first-generation college goers to put together all of the records that they need to do to apply to college was just, it was surprisingly very challenging. Uh, a high school counselor supports about 480 students in Dallas ISD. So you can imagine the amount of time and attention uh, that some of these students do get. And, uh, you know, it's not just your transcripts. It could be your meningitis shots. And every time you want to pull those records, that's $10. And you start adding all of that up, the time, money. Um, we felt that the time had come to use technology to solve this, this problem. And that's how we started Greenlight. Yeah. And next, Scott. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and I'm thrilled to see you all here. I was not able to be here last year. Um, so being here this year and just seeing the growth and the development of, of Velocity is just is fabulous. So we're seeing, I think, two different things that are happening that, that kind of play into the reason we're here and, and so active. Uh, one is, and I'm going to play a little parlor game for those of you who don't know the answer to this. Please, please partake. Some of you do know the answer. Um, is the growth of credentials and just educational and occupational credentials and how massive and confusing and complex that marketplace is. So the, the parlor game is this. If we think about uh, credentials being everything from a high school diploma, a certificate, a license, a, an apprenticeship, a certification, a degree, all across the United States, how many credentials do you think there are in the marketplace? Shout them out. Someone knows the answer. Thank you very much in the back. Uh, yeah, there's just about a million unique credentials in the United States offered by about 60,000 different providers. So take a second and think about how confusing it is for an individual to be able to navigate that, but for employers to be able to find and get the necessary information they need to understand not just do I have that credential but what does that credential mean? What's in it? What are the skills that are transmitted in that credential? How does it translate to other credentials? Was it a quality credential? Is it accredited? Is it, if it's not an institution of higher education, is it recognized by ISO or ANSI or some other third party body? So we're seeing this massive growth and this massive marketplace, which is really hard to, to navigate and to understand. The second thing we're seeing is that with the growth of the economy and the impacts of things like COVID, employers and others are realizing we can't just rely on the traditional methods of getting people into the workforce. Just saying that people need to go to university has never been enough, but we've tried it. And I think that we're realizing more and more, and as I talk to people around the world from OECD and United Nations and other countries, they definitely recognize we have to have the top of the pipeline as broad as it could possibly be. And that means that we need to be able to understand and convey information about every type of credential and all of the skills that it represents, that they all represent, in order to be able to help move people into and through the pipeline successfully, help them continue to move up, and help employers be able to understand every possible avenue that an individual could travel to get to them. 
And all of that means that the work we do to bring transparency to that entire marketplace is all well and good, but unless it can be conveyed and shared in secure ways through things like Greenlight and Velocity and other tools there, it doesn't mean a thing. So for us, being part of Velocity is an absolutely natural partnership because when we bring transparency to the marketplace, these other partners are the ones that convey the information and help it travel to actually bring the value to the individuals and the employers. So we see these macro trends coming together perfectly and the response being so ideal at this moment. Thank you. So I have to say this, I was coming in here today and my wife who's uh, in, in town with me said, honey, you don't usually take notes for something like this. You know what you're talking about. And I said, no. She said, it must be so you'll know what not to say today. So this is what not to say. Um, <laughs> so a couple of things. Acro, that's a, you know, it's alphabet soup. Let me tell you what that is. American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. And you mentioned registrars. I think most people know what a registrar does. They're probably the person that said no to you at some point or charged you for something that you needed to get a job. That's the wrap that registrars have. Um, our association has 11,000 members in 32 countries, so not just American, even though it's in our name. But the function of our role related to credentials in the macro is, well, registrars and credentials. Those two words go together. And even though I feel like um, what Spiro Agnew once said, a nattering nabob of negativity, sometimes here, because I'm saying, well, we're not quite there. Well, we're not quite doing this. And I think Manoj, and I had the privilege of, of knowing his work in Dallas, he gave you a use case of sort of, here's what could happen. I'm here to say that in about 90% of the other higher ed institutions, that's not happening. And that's the challenge uh, we have. Our friends from HCA pointed out as well, I think um, macro, there are opportunities in healthcare in engineering, in, in industries and, and degrees that are regulated or that have some very specific skills-based uh, track. But the rest of higher education is challenging. The other thing I want to say is when I say higher education, I'm lumping a lot of things in there. So let's be clear. International versus U.S., I recognize that those of you from other countries, your system doesn't look like our wacky system. Um, it probably looks better. The, uh, we have 50 basic systems of higher ed. Secondly, within higher ed, there are distinctions, even in the United States. You mentioned the community college. Community colleges are ripe for exactly the things we're doing here, and they're doing it. They just don't often have the capacity or the personnel or the resources. You move on up the, the ladder, and you've got mid-tier regions, like where I worked at UNT. A little easier, but hard because of size. And then you get into research institutions and selectives and privates. I, I hate to break it. It's, this is not there yet. Um, it's just not there because there's not a vision for the need. And just like most industries, it, change has to be forced. And I, I hate to say that. So, so I want to, I'm not representing higher ed here. There are other folks in the room who do, but I feel like on this panel, I have a burden to sort of say the state of things. So from a macro perspective, absolutely. Uh, credentials of all types are of value, not just higher education credentials. And higher education has a duty and an obligation to move itself into the world where the various kinds of credentials and for folks who don't go to college, for crying out loud, not everybody goes to college. There are millions and millions and millions of people in the world, in the United States, that do not need to go to higher education. And we need to figure that out as well. And actually, that's a great segue and point. It kind of throws back to the address that DJ just gave us on Juneteenth and equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, to my next question, and, and it connects to that idea, how do verifiable digital credentials support diversity and equity? Like we heard the high level pitch, but from a tactical perspective, you know, how do we get it done? And I'd like for um, Scott, if you could take that question and then Minaj. Sure. So uh, I think it's important that we, we cast this net, as, as Mike was saying, broader than just traditional higher education. Um, you know, the vast majority of those million credentials that I mentioned are not in traditional higher education. So we've got to be able to capture and describe not just those credentials, but the skills and the connections between all of those. Truly, it's a pathway question, not just an individual credential or skill set that you're earning. 
um, and be able to have those be owned and securely transmitted by anyone. Because we have to recognize, and, and all of you in this room, you wouldn't be here if you didn't recognize this, right? But this is the conversation we have to have more broadly, is in order to help people who are not going to college in a country in the United States that still heavily favors that signal, we have to be able to convey what are the actual skills and be able to have them be transmitted in a verified manner. What are the skills that you're earning when you have a certificate or a certification or a license or an apprenticeship or a badge? Um, that you may be earning from this conference or any number of other places that say, what did you earn and learn? And how does that convey into the skill requirements of an employer? And the more we can be doing that for everybody and not have to have them worry about, well, I think I earned these things and I learned these things that that certificate program I went through and, and it's actually issued and securely held and verified and then to be able to be shared at their discretion empowers people in ways that they've never been empowered before. And I think that's one of the real keys of the uh, verifiable credentials, of learning and employment records, of secure wallets. That is the vision for so many people who are getting onto this this work right now. Is It's not just empowering those of us who probably, I'm, I'm guessing almost everyone in this room went to college. This is not about helping us, right? We're fine. This is about making sure that we're helping all those people who have fallen outside of the traditional mechanisms and support systems that have been in place in this and so many other countries be able to share what they know and what they've earned and be able to move ahead in the marketplace in ways that we've not supported them in the past. And I think that's one of the real powers of, of, of verifiable credentials. Thank you. Um, let me, yeah, it's, it's a segue from what you just said, but I'm going to look at this from respond to this from three different, again, perspectives. One is time, second is money, and third is implicit bias. Time, um, those especially who are maybe poor or who are working multiple jobs, for them to take time off their work, to go out and pull, get access to their verified records, you know, apply to call, you know, to, if they're applying to a college or to an employer, that is something that they don't have uh, easily. I still recall this conversation with the community college president in West Texas, and he said, our biggest challenge is really getting people who want to study here, but working adults, but to be able to go out and get their records, they just don't have time because they're working in two or three jobs, right? The second is money. And I talked about, you know, uh, students having to spend $10 every time they want to send a record. I mean, uh, colleges uh, charge money, $20, $30. So it's basically, again, who does that disproportionately impact? Um, so that's the other lens. And the third is, I think, in my head more than anybody else's. So I, I, but I feel it's, a, it's an important point. You know, as software tools that automate inbound records um, they do a much better job of reducing bias in uh, applicant profiling and you know accepting records and and I think as you get more and more verifiable credentials adopted in the marketplace, uh, you will be you, you know it could basically help significantly in in addressing all of the DEI challenges. So. Thank you. And then going back to something Scott said. You know, you mentioned that we're not necessarily talking about us in the room, college goers. We're, we're talking about everyone and a lot of us that don't go to college. But there's also the aspect of learning, as you mentioned, that happens outside of college. And you may go to college for one thing and end up doing something totally different. And it's other certifications along your journey that get you there. So in my next question is, how do verifiable digital credentials support lifelong learning, regardless of whether they are traditional degrees, micro-credentials, or other? And I'd love to have each of your perspectives on it from your different lenses. Um, why don't we start with you with Mike, and then we'll kind of go down the line. Sure. A couple of concepts. One is the idea of, of learning mobility. So we are all stuck in credit mobility do my things transfer you know that's sort of an inside baseball world that we in higher education play do i get credits when i transfer here and that that's got to go away but it's not it's it's still where we're stuck but the, so learning mobility means can i move my skills right my grades my skills my all the things like that 
And that's where the vast majority of credentials you're talking about, Scott, I mean, those are your tools um, in power. Um, but secondly, uh, once again, higher education is um, threatened by lifelong learning because that's not what most higher education institutions are built for. They're built for a specific period of learning. The bright spot in this is professional continuing education units are, in fact, doing this, working on programs that are more employee and skill-based responsible or responsive programs, but those are not often tied to the academic endeavor. And, and frankly, we're working hard with our colleagues at the, uh, uh, at the professional continuing education associations to figure out how to move those records just internally, much less a- out for um, students. And so it is a challenge. Once again, I'm a nattering nabob of negativity. Sorry. Oh, yeah. And you'll leave it at that for I'm now? I'm leaving it at that. Well, that's... A, I've got a, some positive for later. I okay, promise. okay. We'll look forward to that. Um, Manoj, can you pick up on that? Hopefully a little bit more positive, right? Yes, I'll try. Um, you know, if you, if you think of having, building a stackable set of verified credentials, uh, obviously, you... you, you, you you can start thinking of this from, you know, Velocity today, as an example, all, you know, today is the first layer on the job, which is basically get access to your verified credentials. That's great. Then what? What if you have access to your verified credentials and you have visibility into what kind of jobs are out there and what kind of salaries it pays? And this is something that I know Credential Engines thought about quite a bit in different pathway programs, and now you know that if you could add a few more verified skills, you have access to so many so many more job opportunities or higher wages and salaries, et cetera. So I think that you know what, what we're all doing today is just the first step. But as, as other vendors start basically building some of that other intelligence, um, the technology can pitch to you and say, you know, you just basically build you know, three more skills or three more certificates or three more credentials, and your salary can go from $60,000 to $100,000, as an example. And I think that's the great promise of this technology. Interesting. I almost want to invite HCA back up because we think about lifelong learning. I want to invite IBM. I want to invite the the folks at Deloitte and Morgan back up because for, for most people, after you go through your formal education, your lifelong learning happens on the job. And so being able to work with all of those employers to not just be the consumers of this information about credentials and skills, but to actually have them be active contributors back into the ecosystem of everything that they're offering. And for a number of years, I ran American Society for Training and Development's Global Benchmarking Forum. And we would look at all of the internal training and development that companies offered to their employees around the world and that has to be fed back into the ecosystem, right? You have to be able to, to get not just what is this individual bringing to me, but then what are they earning on the job and how is that contributing to their lifelong learning and to that record? Um, so it, it has to be a, a, a not just you know two-way, it has to be a three, four, or five, six-way conversation into really enriching that individual's um, records. And, and I, the kind of worn analogy that I use is we have to be better able to provide services like ways for individuals on their pathways because we all start off going through high school college into a job thinking i know my perfect pathway i can see what i'm going to go do and life happens and COVID hits and your pathway gets interrupted and all of a sudden healthcare is looking for tens of thousands of new people and hundreds of thousands of people were, were laid off elsewhere how do you help them have a ways tool that says, with just a few more skills, with just this additional um, you know, contribution to your record, HCA wants to hire you because they're desperate for people in this, this, and this position. Not all doctors, right? There's a lot of other people that were being hired then, and we don't have that capability because we don't have the rich information about what everyone has been earning on the job throughout the last 20 years when all of a sudden they were laid off. So we've got to have richer information about the whole picture in order to really contribute to that lifelong learning and their pathway capabilities. 
okay, so now what we've done is we've established the value proposition to employers, and we've also discussed it from the lens of the individual and what value they get. So now let's go back to our negative state that we're in, and is there any value to higher education? What is the value proposition to a verifiable credentials in education? Yes, I'm going to start because this is the positive part of the presentation. So um, I'm pretty passionate about this, but I believe that uh, in the scenario, for example, you described and, and hundreds of others, I see my friends from WGU back here, there are places where these credentials are making a difference in the lives of learners because they're exposing to the learner what they know, which doesn't happen when I give you an A or a B. That doesn't happen. But with these credentials being issued within and, and outside of um, higher ed, that, that's the first thing, learner-centered. They're able to see and articulate what they know which is the holy grail for higher education, the metacognition. How do I know? What do I know? How do I know what I know? Credentials empower that, actually. So there's actually an educational philosophy behind that. And so it's a good thing. Um, secondly, the value of higher education itself can be better articulated right now as it's questioned. I'm questioning it. Many of you in the room question it. It doesn't fit well into the, some of these conversations we're having. It's awkward. We don't do that. But with the type of uh, verifiable credentials of some quality, then it does able, uh, enable higher education to demonstrate value to the public, to policymakers, to the learners themselves, to the parents. Um, I always tell this story that when you survey uh, students, the, the number one reason they say they're going to go to college is to get a job. Survey their parents. The number one reason they say they're going to college is to get them a job or get them out of the house. Same thing. And number three, when you survey faculty, about 56% of faculty say that getting a job has anything to do with the students that they're teaching. Now, that's not to disparage faculty having taught for 20 some years. It's simply to say, we've got some gaps to fill and credentials to me help also expose the value of what faculty are doing. I've sat in faculty meeting after faculty meeting and said, wouldn't you like people to know what you're doing in this room? Because an A or a B or a C doesn't do that. Your, your course title, your catalog are insufficient. If you can issue credentials that have meaning based on the work that you're doing in class, it elevates your work in the grand scheme of things and brings value to you. So on those three levels, I think there's a tremendous value to be gained uh, from credentials in higher education. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then one thing you said in there was quality of credentials. Uh, maybe, Scott, that's something you'd like to pick up on and answer this question. So I, I want to start by just expanding what Mike was saying is that higher ed has a lot to gain here, but the reality is that almost every education and occupational credential issuer has probably gotten trapped into, this is what I teach, whether it is a degree program, a certification program, I am here in an industry certification body to deliver these particular industry skills, and you forget that the individual probably is learning not just the skills, but more, the, the teamwork, the critical thinking, and that you can enrich that even further if you're thinking about a couple of other credentials you build in to continue to enrich it. So I think every education and occupational credential provider right now is probably in a place where they're thinking, I am at risk of losing something if I don't think about how do I continue to enrich and share more richly what it is that we're actually imparting to whoever's sitting in my classroom or my, my session. Um, so I, I think there's this conversation is, is broader than just the traditional higher ed. I think everyone is kind of struggling with this right now. Um, so on, on the quality issue, um, you know, th there, are, there are so many credentials out there and there are so many uh, poorly run, poorly structured um, credentials that yield no value that there is an enormous focus right now on how do we understand the quality of credentials and how do we embed those quality indicators into the information that's then being shared forward. And, and there's no one silver bullet to this. There is no one perfect answer. Um, so what we work on a lot is how do we help uh, understand all the different measures of quality? And it could be everything from a well-designed program and you're accredited to the, um, the, the learnings that are issued to the immediate uh, occupational uh, placement rates to long-term return on investment. All of those and many more have value and have meaning in being able to convey what the, what the quality of a credential is. Uh, you know, we are not 
trying to come up with the perfect measure. We work with um, states, we work with employer groups, we work with others to help us understand what it is they care about. And then we make all that information uh, transparent and accessible in order to let others make, make a more informed decision. That's really where we're, our, our role in this marketplace. Thank you. And, you know, it's interesting because in both of your responses, one thing we haven't talked about, and I'm going to do a shout out to my colleagues at One Ed Tech, they mentioned it in one of their committee meetings. We didn't talk about that educational institutions are employers too. And in my region, for example, our number one employers, like in terms of size, our number one are healthcare, and number two are educational institutions. I live in South Florida region. And so with that, um, my next question I'd like to pitch to Minaj, I'd like you to kind of speak about, you know, picking up on the, the theme so far, um, you know, education is a feed for employment. Can you speak about how verifiable credentials support that connection? Yeah, uh, I'm assuming all of you sitting here uh, have hired somebody at some point of time. If you haven't, just raise your hand. And so what did you think, what, what were you looking out for? I mean, do you really think that a verified credential would have helped you in hiring? Maybe yes. So there are two things that I feel as, you know, when I'm hiring someone, I may have wanted, right? One is content. And then, of course, second is time. Uh, the content is, and I think both Mike and Scott touched upon it, if... If a degree just basically tells you the GPA was 3.67, that's fine. But really, I'm looking for some of the other skills that a college is not necessarily measuring or a school. And so how do I basically assess that? And I think there's going to be, out of the 60,000 credential issuers, there's going to be much better rigor, I suspect, over time in terms of comparing which credential is useful and helpful for me to make that analysis and make an offer. The second perspective is, and we heard HCA talk about this. I mean, in, in Dallas, I was speaking to UT Southwestern, and they said a physician that they had basically brought in from Ohio, that person was just sitting around doing nothing, paid for for six months because physician credentialing was taking that long to do. And so, uh, you know, when you think about this from, from an employer's perspective, of course, I want to hire somebody where that credential matters that it's of some use, and how soon can I basically uh, process that? Uh, I think those are the two perspectives. Uh, I, if for, and if you're at a university, uh, you know, you have to do the same two things. I mean, I, am I, if I'm hiring a teacher or a professor, I still have to go and verify that credential, and that takes time, as an example. Thank you. And then I know that we're almost at time, so to wrap us up, I'd like for each of us to end with you know, just sharing your perspective on how velocity helps address some of the macro issues that we're seeing in terms of education, equity, empowerment. Um, let's just uh, work down the line and kind of give us some closing thoughts. Mike? Sure. The reason we came um, to Velocity, we were invited, but the other reason is um, we felt that this was important enough in the grand conversation uh, of things. All the issues we've touched on here that haven't been solved, we feel like Velocity is touching on those issues. Just because higher education generally is not there yet doesn't mean it doesn't need to go there. Um, I'm not a big believer in the if you build it, they will come, but I also know that if it's not built, right? And so people need something to go to and migrate to. And we could, we've talked ideally about these kind of things in higher ed for a long time, but as you know, until you walk in the door with something it's, it's nothing, and it's just good ideas. And so with Velocity, um, we think that that is a, uh, you, you know, one of, one of um, a number of opportunities that higher education would have to look. Now, you know, for our association, for registrars, I'll argue that the transcript is still the foundational employment record in the United States, whether that's a yes, no, they have it or not, but it's still there. Now, whether that needs to be the case and will continue to be the case, I, none of us are sure. But for our members, we don't want to be um, block plus blockbuster in a Netflix world, and that's what it's sort of feeling like. So we, we need to move the notion of what a, an individual uh, a learner record looks like, and it's not owned by the institution. Uh, the information in it is of value, 
and it has the criteria and characteristics of the infrastructure that Velocity has. Thank you. Yeah. What attracted us to Velocity is just this incredible ecosystem that they have, uh, that we have uh, all thoughtfully put together. I mean, it's not just credential issuers, but also uh, an incentive mechanism for the credential, uh, for credential issuers to issue credentials. It is the, uh, for the verification, uh, how, you know, for the verifiers, et cetera. It's that the software companies, the, it's a, it's a wonderful ecosystem and, if it works well, and I'm pretty confident it will, I think it can solve a lot of problems. And we are, you know, uh, Greenlight was focused on the student journey, it, that that transition between high school to college to employment, which is a microcosm of the overall landscape of a person's life of basically gathering his or her credentials and getting jobs. But we felt that this partnership would be incredibly valuable for us. And we have we probably are the world's largest uh, blockchain platform storing credentials with over 6 million uh, credentials on, on, on the platform. And for us to be basically part of this ecosystem is exciting for us. Great. So let me, let me end this with going back to kind of, I think, core shared principles. Um, the first is when we looked at this, um, we care about things like transparency. Velocity is completely transparent about what they're doing, how they're going about it, and and how to be involved. Uh, the second is open data. We we believe that there are certain elements of of the marketplace and the ecosystem that that will benefit from having true open data, not personally identifiable information, um, but things about what it is you've earned, the credentials, the quality of an institution should be in the open marketplace. And I think we share that principle. Um, the third is interoperability. If, if we know that this is something that is said this is, it goes through the system and comes out on the other hand saying this is what this is. So there is a trust in how the information is being shared. Uh, the fourth is uh, kind of ownership by the first party, right? The, there, there is real clarity that uh, no one gets to get into this marketplace and just make wild assertions. There are going to be protections for this is what we offer, this is what it is. And I can stand behind that. And I think that's really important. And, and the fifth for us is that we are all kind of vendor agnostic. We want everyone to play. We want everyone to be in this marketplace. No one has, has primacy over what they're going to do on this, on this platform, whether it's ours or, or Velocity's. Um, and I think those, as, as we sat and looked at this from the beginning and, and continued on and then decision to join the board, that if our principles didn't align, um, we, we were not going to be a part of this and we feel very confident and very comfortable that this is a perfect alignment and the best way to move forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I didn't mention that Scott serves on our board of directors, so does Manoj and Mike serves on our advisory board. So thank you so much for your perspectives and your comments, as well as your participation and leadership of Velocity. Thank you.